Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, July 10th, 2018 meeting of the Northwest School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair, and we'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Present. Present. Here. Present. Present. Okay. Um, so, is there anyone who wishes to speak in the public comment this evening? Okay, so we'll then move on. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? You, um, I, some of you know, I would like to update you guys on what I've been doing since our last meeting. Um, I was appointed to serve on the nominating committee for the MASC, and so we met and interviewed candidates um, and voted and put forth the slate that will be voted on then at the assembly. Um, and then last night um, I met, I was appointed to the um, resolutions committee, and um, we met for hours in Marlboro. <laughs> discuss the resolutions that have been brought forth um, and voted on which ones would go to the board of directors to then be brought forth at the delegate assembly. Um, and then tomorrow night I'll be going um, to the board of directors meeting for the first time in my capacity as vice chair for region five. Um, and we'll get to discuss the resolutions again. Um, and I would hope that maybe this year the committee considers discussing the resolutions before having your delegate to the assembly vote on it, um, as some of them are uh, a little bit trickier than, than I think in the past, it's been pretty straightforward and we could assume how the committee would, would want someone to vote, but I think this year you might want to consider discussing them as a committee. Um, and then the last thing is um, next Friday and Saturday is the MASC Summer Institute, um, Friday and Saturday, and I'll be attending, um, and I don't know if anyone else was, but I think registration's still open and it's really a useful um, program, I think so. So that's it. Thank you. And will you be able to send the committee a link to all the resolutions mm -hmm. when they're yeah? Those usually to... yeah. Those those the official ones will probably come out um, about six weeks beforehand. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, any other announcements? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we'll move into the recommended actions portion of. Uh, of the agenda and we have a consent agenda this evening that includes the approval of minutes of the superintendent evaluation team uh, June 20th 2018 a special school committee <coughs> meeting, also on June 20th 2018 and then the rules and policy subcommittee meeting of June 21st 2018 is there I accept a motion to approve the consent agenda Move to approve the consent agenda second uh, there's been a motion made and seconded to accept the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, we have um, reports and recommendations, and we have a couple of uh, votes related to budget transfers. Uh, the first is a, uh, a requested budget transfer to create a .5 preschool teacher position. And I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Provost. Thank you. This one is very straightforward. It, when we created the budget, we had 11 kindergartens. Um, kindergarten is always the grade that we have the least amount of certainty about um, because we project students already enrolled just moving up a grade with some additions and some losses. But kindergarten is basically a best guess. At this point, we're confident that we won't need the 11th kindergarten. However, we do need to have a ninth preschool. And so my request is that we transfer this $30,000 from Bridge Street, which would be for the third kindergarten, to Bridge Street for preschool to create the ninth classroom. Make a motion to approve the budget transfer to create a 0.5 preschool teacher position. Second. Second. Any questions or discussions on that? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, it seems like a kindergarten entire classroom would cost more than $30,000. So if we're eliminating an entire kindergarten classroom, I guess I can move this, um, where does the other money go? Or how do I account for that? That stays in the budget. It's right now in excess that would allow us to deal with some uninspected um, okay. contingencies. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, uh, next there's a uh, requested uh, vote on budget transfers to create student services positions. Uh, occupational therapist, physical therapist, and two special education teachers. And I believe uh, Ms. Plummer is here to discuss this proposal. Hi. So I think I've mentioned this a little bit before when I've spoken to be, um, in previous meetings, but our department is one that fluctuates quite dramatically at times. And we definitely had some changes over the spring that occurred after the budget was finalized. Um, largely, it has resulted in some pretty large savings for the district based on students who have moved to least, less restrictive environments. Some students have moved from less restrictive environments and out of district placements um, to placements that, um, for instance, from, an, uh, from a private day placement to our collaborative, which has in, uh, resulted in tuition savings. Others have moved into the district, um, which has been quite exciting. Um, and the students have been very successful. And I think the piece that remains constant is as we find funding that, and we've presented you with a couple of things this year, that becomes available as students' tui um, tuition money becomes available, we increase programming within the district. Maybe not spend all of that money, but spend some of that in order to try to increase prog programming to prevent students from leaving. So one area where we see some um, a potential for some, a significant impact is at the high school, um, where we we have been, well, through our audit this year, one of the things that came up, and you'll see that later when we talk about our mid-cycle review, um, this, the model that currently exists at the high school um, is largely a model where students receive their special education services through a learning strategies class, which is a quarter of their day. And I've mentioned this before to some of you that, that once you hit that mark, you ultimately are not even considered fully included in your day. So any student who takes learning strategies every day already is considered partially included in their day. It's a big chunk of time. Um, we've been working with Principal Lombardi and his faculty to try to create uh, different ways that students can receive their services in just that standard approach. And it obviously takes a lot of time. Some of the money we spent from our 274 grant this year was um, put towards a group of, of teachers and others who were studying the schedule. And obviously that's a long-term project. Um, but one of the things that's come up, <coughs> we moved a couple of students back into the district who were in out-of-district placements, is just our awareness of what we can provide versus some of the out-of-district placements. I think some of you are aware that Tri-County closed this year really abruptly and we needed to find placements for six students. Um, currently, I only have placements. I don't. I only have solid placements for two of them. Um, we're still trying very hard to find placements for some of them. And I'm confident that we'll get there, but it is a big process. And um, what we're finding, especially at the high schools, we have some students who are struggling, who folks aren't ready to say, um, a private day placement is an appropriate placement for them, or even the collaborative necessarily, um, that really we just need to think more creatively about the type of programming we're creating at the high school, and also hopefully try to bring on some folks who have more uh, experience with kids who have, um, just need a little bit, uh, just need to feel like they belong in a little bit of a different way. and. So we've talked about creating a more behavioral uh, support program, which would involve needing a special education teacher focused solely <coughs> on how to integrate engaging academics. I'm sure we are going to be able to have our BCB on staff. We're going to have some support staff who are able to support the students socially, emotionally. Um, we're looking into contracting with the center school, similarly to how we did with Bridge Street this year. And we're still in the details of what that would look like um, with Principal Lombardi. But the one thing we're certain of is that we would need to have a, a solid special education teacher who's committed to that very small group of students, which may at the beginning only be a couple of students, um, in order to help create some creative programming for them. So that's the first position. Um, and uh, some of that is being, I mentioned in the memo, um, funded through some tuition savings that we have for students who've come back to the high school. 
The other position is more um, specific, and we've mentioned earlier that we've had the opportunity to increase our funding, uh, our programming for uh, deaf students at the high school, and part of that involved trying to create a more inclusive culture around the deaf community. And we've had, I think the last I heard was 55 students who have signed up for an American Sign Language class this fall, which is really exciting. Um, but what we've learned this spring by creating programming is what we originally thought was we would need a teacher of the deaf and a special education teacher, a teacher of the deaf who could support the special education needs of some of our students, but also teach some ASL sections and then have a paraprofessional. And what we've realized is that that won't be enough to meet the special education needs of some of the students in our, in our building, that really we need a special education teacher who's available and also a teacher of the deaf who then could have um, two periods of the day, half their day, where they'd be teaching a pretty large group of students to um, use American Sign Language, which is exciting. Um, the other two positions are a little bit more straightforward. We've had a really hard time with both um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. Sarah Harvey was our physical therapist for years and she left us last year and it was really hard. Um, and also um, Jody, the PTA, retired after many, many years and it was really challenging. We found a great PTA but she's resigned. Um, we have a salary schedule that is uh, includes our physical therapy assistants and speech language pathology assistants and the CODA, which you approved um, on the same scale as ESP, slightly different, but it still is less than local districts do. There are other districts. We've interviewed quite a few people who get pretty far along in the process and then say there's just not enough money. They get paid as teachers in other districts. Or they can work in clinic settings and um, make a lot more money. So in terms of the CODA, which I'll mention first, we had originally hoped to, we knew we needed to increase occupational therapy services in the district. So we, in the budget, we had said, let's try for a CODA. Since then, one of our part-time OTs has resigned. She was very part-time. And we, and that person has been at the, high, at the middle school. And so we started thinking about, well, what's the likelihood that we're actually going to be able to get a CODA? Um, I started looking at the savings that if we were to bring on another OT that we would save from having to contract out. We've been contracting out with HEC for some of our services for this year. So if we use that savings plus the savings of the person who resigned plus, um, plus some of the, uh, the fact that the, if we were to hire an OT that person would be able to provide service for some of our out of district students, um, it really seemed to be uh, just a, a good a good plan to try to go for an OT. OTs are able to do direct service but also evaluations um, so they have and they're able to supervise um, in a way that CODAs can't. So it seems like we will have a much more likely opportunity to hire an OT than we would a CODA. Similar to the PTA. Um, they're very similar positions and the more we realized it, we're, we've been also spending a fair amount on contracted services for physical therapy. So through some tuition savings, through the fact that our PT can work with some of the out of district students, which isn't a very large amount, but it actually some of the contracts add up, um, we'd be able to hire a, a PT instead of a PTA. Um, so we definitely have the funds for it. Like I said, things are, are um, very, there's lots of moving parts in special education, but I feel pretty confident that this is a conservative um, way to provide some real increased services, professional services in our district. These are all professional positions. So. Are there questions from the school committee about uh, these proposals? I guess I have a question. I'm sure. trying to think about it. So um, I see t these. For me, um, these fit in two different categories. The second part, the physical therapy assistant and the um, CODA and that set, seems like you found some efficiencies and you're replacing the need, a former position we had with a slightly different position, but filling the same needs and, and addressing the same group of kids. So I think I understand that one. Um, but the stuff that you described ahead of that, I just want to understand it a little better and I might have some more questions. 
these there's a group of kids coming from out of district placements and um, with different needs and some of them are going to go to new out of district placements and some of them are coming back into the Northampton schools which is terrific so all the students who the but the savings are based on have already come back and and in the budget it looks like that's is it 115,000 or is it more than that coming back? Is um, that just part of it? Candy had looked at. Find the right We're thing. using 115 to fund the two teachers doing estimated salaries because right. they're not hired yet. Right. But the actual tuition money may be higher. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so I think that was part of my <coughs> question, trying to understand this. We're not. We're not saying all this tuition money is coming back and we're going to spend it all on serving this. Right. This. this is what you think you need to spend out of that money to hire the to, position to support this group of students coming back, but the cost of it is less than their out of district tuition. Is that correct? That, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's why I wanted yeah. to understand. Thank you. There's a pretty wide range of the cost of some of our out of district placements. They range from forty thousand to some are over two hundred thousand. Sure. So this is a fraction of that money, and it's you saying this is what we need to support these kids coming back, but it's yeah. not saying let's spend every last penny of this money coming back. And hopefully prevent other students yes. from needing to. Yes. That's yes. really the goal. And so what happens, and I'm just trying to understand this, the money that isn't in this 115, it goes with the extra mm -hmm. kindergarten teacher, so we have a little more money to um, fall back on when we have other problems. Which doesn't okay. always happen okay. <laughs> at the beginning of the year. right? Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Okay, I make a, a motion to approve the budget transfers to create the student service positions as outlined by Ms. Plummer. Second. And a motion made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. And while you're well, I guess while you're there, um, the next it's item on the agenda is a report on the coordinated program review mid-cycle report. Mm -hmm. So, first year in this position, got to participate in two audits, which was very exciting. <laughs> uh, and uh, the nice part about our this coordinated program review is there really weren't any surprises. As Josh and Dave and I came on and really came into our roles, um, there were a lot of things I did this year that I didn't have my hand in too much in previous years. Um, and a lot of that came to do with like the little nitty gritty details of service delivery and some of the way we have processes and procedures in our office and how we handle certain things. So when we got, when we met with everyone, by just reviewing the files that they were going to look at, um, really we, we were pretty prepared to know exactly what they were going to say. And the nice part was we had already started developing those ideas ourselves about where we need to grow and where we need to focus. Um, so it, I really wanted to have a chance for Dave and Josh to come up here because this is a chance for them to describe some of the ways that they've been really involved. Um, but the first one, <coughs> we're just gonna go through the criterion um, it's important to know that they don't look at every criterion. We're in the mid-cycle, so they're really only looking at the areas um, that were partially implemented in the past. Um, but the first one was transition planning. And this is something that's been not just for Northampton, kind of a, a big push recently. The state came out with an advisory this spring um, for how to more effectively plan transition for students. Really, you're supposed to start at 14 and grow from there. So you have a 14-year-old student at a team meeting, and you start talking about what are your plans for after you graduate, let's help you get there, knowing that you can change your mind. But our job, our obligation is to provide something in your IEP that helps you start to develop those skills. Some other districts, so I know I had a mentor who recommends starting in second grade that you start having conversations with with families about oh, this is a long-term process childhood into adulthood but it goes by very quickly um, so our plan already this fall was to really focus at the high school and some of the transition planning forms so that's something that we we had already done and we're going to be doing with more uh, we had already started talking with some of the folks at the high school um, but largely some of that is a nitty-gritty detail it's making sure we have something called the transition planning form that looks pretty much identical to the goal that's provided in the IEP. So what happens when they do these audits is they look at a small number of files and if they find two 
that have the same problem, you, get a, you end up having to have some sort of corrective action. So we had a couple that need some work. So what we'll be doing on a lot of these uh, areas is we'll be reconvening those specific teams this fall, but really across the whole um, middle and high school, we're gonna be focusing largely on transition planning. Um, so the next one is about progress reports, which is near and dear to Dave's heart. And he really came in hoping that we could jump head on into it. And I think we, we've had to slow down a little bit, but now we have our, um, our progress report that's due next October. So it gives us some uh, extra reason to focus on this next fall. So the progress report mandate, uh, at least as often as uh, uh, students or parents of students in the general population are informed of their child's progress, students with disabilities, uh, their parents have to be informed as well. So one of the things that was important to me coming in was the idea that the information contained within those progress reports, not so much just a compliance piece, but also the substance of it, was that it contained information that was both pertinent and relevant to parents so they could both be uh, better participants during team meetings, but also so that the team, other members of the team's district side were using that information to both evaluate whether the IEP was doing its job and for planning purposes over the course of time. So it, for example, how it feeds into transition from 14 on so that we know we're moving forward. So it's part of it is how the progress reports are written, but it really starts before in how we structure goals because you can't write uh, quantitatively about a goal that is not measurable. So one of the things we spent all year doing and staff have been very receptive to is in crafting their goals in thoughtful ways that are measurable, that are feasible. So when we talk about not being data driven but being data informed, thinking about when we're crafting a goal, what does that look like? How do we take a student's current performance level, where they are, and what are the appropriate metrics uh, given the student's individual um, profile and presentation for that, and how do we craft a goal that we, we can then come back to every quarter or trimester, semester, whatever the case may be, and make meaningful statements about how far along we are on that path. So if need be, we can reconvene the team and make alterations midstream if we need to change the service delivery model or something to make sure. So really where we've seen the progress this year was in staff's both perspective on the process uh, staff's crafting goals so that the structure of IEPs from tip to tail at this point has become um, closer in orientation to allowing us to generate progress supports that are both quantifiable and really meet the desire, the spirit of the law in terms of being helpful in parents and other members of the team in being able to say where are we you know, on the student's trajectory over the course of the year. Um, so one of the things I'm really excited about is seeing where we were in September and where we are now. One of the things I was saying to Pam is when I came on board in August, I couldn't have even realized that where we are now represented success. Um, and it's really uh, encouraging to see the steps that we made. And I think we're well poised not only to meet our uh, progress report, our progress reporting uh, obligations for the corrective action here, but just moving forward. So I think we're, uh, staff has been very responsive to that. And I think we're Um, to put it really plainly, I had a parent say to me, you know, I'm so used to getting progress reports that said how nice my child was and how much growth she'd made and how hard she was trying, but then I got <coughs> one that actually showed objective one, progressing, objective two, met, objective three, likely not to meet, and it just was, that was the most quantifiable thing she had seen in a long time. And so we have a balance in Northampton, right, to go simply to, on this particular measure, the goal is whether they can do this 80% of the time, and they say so-and-so can do this 75% of the time. Some families might find that a bit of a shift to go from such a lovely qualitative narrative to just the quantitative, so it's something that we're working on in our shift. Um, the next one is timelines for determination of eligibility and provision of uh, documentations to parents. We've been cr pretty good about our timelines, um, but this year we, uh, it's been very clear that we, and I remember this from when we had our full audit, we got commended for how responsive we are to families and how often we meet with families and what that means is we have a lot of meetings that result in a lot more paperwork. Amendments, if we have over 600 students with IEPs and each of them has a team meeting, but then each of them has an amendment, or one of them has six team meetings and two amendments and a transition meeting, every single time that packet of information gets sent down to our office and gets sent out. Um, and it's a, it's a lot. And I think we have the appropriate level of teaching faculty in our buildings. Um, 
but what we need to really work on is helping folks just stay on top of timelines and so Josh is a whiz who's created this system that we're going to be using next year that I'm really excited about so I want to tell you about that um, so one of the trickiest things for all of our special education teachers especially at the elementary level with the transition to the inclusion model was being able to sort of balance being in front of the students as well as meeting the requirements for paperwork and making sure um, by federal law we're required to have whenever a parent requests an evaluation um, or a student is reevaluated every three years um, we have to provide complete our testing in 30 school days and we have to hold the meeting and determine eligibility within 45 um, and so it gets a little bit tricky <coughs> with vacations and MCAS and all of those other factors that pop up um, and so one thing that our faculty felt strongly about and one thing that we felt strongly about in our office too is a way to sort of automate some of that, those processes so that a week before you're supposed to have a meeting invitation sent out you get a reminder that says Johnny's meeting invitation needs to be sent out um, and vice versa once you hold the meeting getting a reminder that says don't forget you're supposed to be submitting your paperwork tomorrow so that it can get mailed out within 10 days to the families um, and so smart sheets is a company that allows us to sort of have smart spreadsheets so it's like Google Sheets on steroids and one of the biggest features of it is that it sends automatic emails based on the formulas that you program into the spreadsheet um, to not only the administration team but also to the faculty themselves to remind them of the things that they need to do and allows us to run quick reports to see how well we're doing with those timelines um, and so that's something that we purchased this year um, and it's almost developed it's the reporting piece um, for the three of us that still needs a little bit of work um, but in terms of the spreadsheet for our faculty that's what we'll be using um, and we tried it at the preschool level because we're a revolving target at the preschool level in terms of constantly all year long right. when a student is going to be turning three we have to evaluate them in a certain amount of time and make sure that we're providing services um, and so we tried smart sheets for two months at the preschool level with tracking our referrals and it worked really really well and it was helpful to have um, Jennifer Towler our registrar as well as Joy our transportation supervisor all on the same page and everybody gets everything at the same time rather than trying to remember did we put it in the inter-office mail did we send that email and losing track of some pieces um, and so we're hopeful that it will be able to generalize to our special education teachers as well um, K through 12 so all right The next one. Oh, I skipped backwards, sorry. Oh, we had one that had to do with um, the PLEP A, which is um, the page that talks about the accommodations that students need around curriculum. There's a PLEP B that's around communication or behavior or social or assistive technology but PLEP A is all about the curriculum we've had feedback in the past that PLEP A does not have to be done for preschoolers well we had two preschoolers with blank PLEP A and we have a finding now so we now will be doing PLEP A's for every single student um, I'm confident that it's not an issue for any other grade level it's just that we had gotten guidance that that's what with the process that has been done for a very long time and um, so we'll be changing that that's a pretty straightforward one Criterion 20 um, is a little frustrating because that was an area um, where we needed to focus um, last time. There's one section of the IEP um, that makes you state why it's necessary to remove a student from the general education setting in order to provide a service. And the statement has to be pretty individualized. It can't be cookie cutter. Um, and it can't be simply because that's the only place the service is provided. Um, so that has been tricky at our high school level. Um, if it's not necessarily based on the student's needs, it's based on the model that we provide. Um, so that, again, gets me back to our need to think more creatively about how we provide services at the high school. I will say that I have noticed a, I have noticed a qualitative shift, an anecdotal shift, in the IEPs that I'm seeing coming from the elementary schools where there has been a move towards more inclusion this year 
where I'm seeing IEPs that previously it was five times 60 pull out, five times 60 pull out, five times 30 pull out. Um, I see IEPs now that say um, three times 45 in class, two times 20 out of class. And in the non-participation justification statement, which is that section, it says the student needs to be in a quiet room to focus on discrete skills and in a way that um, the student isn't distracted. And it's much more specific. Um, and we just need to grow that. We need to grow that understanding. And folks have been pretty good. And I think one of the things I want to remind folks about the um, the audit is it's largely based on IEPs from last year. So they aren't really, the audit wasn't really based on IEPs that we've been seeing come across our desk. It was really ones that were created last year. Um, so I'm feeling pretty confident that um, moving forward and with our more training and with a renewed reminder that this continues to come up as an area that is partially implemented for us, our teachers are going to um, engage in teams in a way that's it's quite thoughtful around where and how we're providing services for students. Um, so that's the last one. Do you have any questions for us? Any questions for Ms. Plummer and the team? Ms. Fallon. Um, is there a cost to the, I don't remember what it was called, the service to organize the software? Yeah, I think it was a thousand It was, it was $700 for the year. Oh, okay. Which we think is going to yeah. be quite <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> Um, so I'm really impressed by your explanation of all of this and it sounds like there's a lot of it, so much progress has been made and it sounds like you can cover it fine but I guess my question is it has to be done by the fall mm -hmm. and is that is it something that's going to take away from your other work in a way that's going to make your life your work with the students which we know is very important um, and I continue to hear feedback from people just how helpful you all are. Mm -hmm. Is there ways that you need more support to get this done so that, because it seems like you've had something added? Mm -hmm. I don't think so, only because we predicted it and we were already okay. planning on doing so much of it in the fall already. There was only so much change that we wanted to really kind of quickly impart on folks that we felt like they'd be able to, especially at the elementary schools where they were um, adjusting so much this year. And I think. I don't think to, it, I don't think it will feel like that. I think that um, we're excited about creating some more efficiencies. The other piece that John has been great about um, is that we've really realized this year our office has like seasonal ebb and flows, and there are times when we're fine, and there are times where we are under literal three, four foot piles, and um, we have some clerical. Uh, funds set aside and we have some lovely <laughs> wonderful secretaries who work in our district who are willing to put in extra time at not all the time but when we need it um, they're amazing proofreaders um, they're they're skilled with using our online platform we have um, Sharon from Leeds and Cheryl from Ryan Road in our office all this week and so being creative about um, really being thoughtful about when we bring on extra help and the cost it, the cost of it and how efficient we can be. I feel really good about we've kind of expanded our network of folks who can help when we get to really busy times to keep the burden off of our teachers and really um, keep it centralized in our paperwork. So. Are there questions? Okay, thank you all for that uh, great report. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda <coughs> is a report from the superintendent evaluation team, and I believe that's being delivered this evening by uh, Mr. Zapsky. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, filling in for Ms. Hennessy tonight in her absence as our chair, the superintendent evaluation team uh, meets uh, three times with the superintendent throughout the year. On June 20th, uh, myself, Ms. Hennessy, and Mr. Kaufman met with uh, Superintendent Provost to discuss the summative evaluation. Um, I'm gonna use the notes, uh, the minutes from the June 20th meeting to kind of guide me through. Um, the evaluation team uh, reviewed each goal and standard with the superintendent, and he explained to us the over 100 pages is that your book? I didn't bring my book. Uh, <laughs> of evidence that supported the goals and the standards, which um, 
he was held uh, accountable for demonstrating um, to us. Uh, some highlights in the big book included um, making 100 school site visits this year, helping to lead the district in applying for and being awarded an innovation pathway implementation grant, helping parents understand curriculum through transfer goal <coughs> videos, giving a talk to the MASS, MASC on the district's expanding global STEM curriculum, being recruited by MASS to speak about supporting students with social and emotional learning needs, being asked by MASC to present to uh, at the Summit on Poverty, learning new strategies for communicating and engaging in relation to difficult topics, serving as the president of the Pioneer Valley Superintendent Tom Table. And just some of the things um, that were highlighted um, in his collection of evidence for us to consider. Uh, the evaluation committee uh, told the superintendent how much of a pleasure it's been to uh, work with him and what an honor it is to have him as our superintendent. We did make a recommendation uh, moving forward as he goal sets for next year that um, as he came to us last month, I believe, and, and asked about uh, rolling over some vacation days, we asked that perhaps part of his goal might be next year to find ways to use more of them during the year as we thought it was important for his social and emotional uh, health to take that time to kind of recharge and to um, better himself so that he can serve us in such a positive way. So this evening, I come to you as a representative of the superintendent tenant evaluation team um, with a recommendation to the full school committee um, as it's our recommendation to rate Dr. Provost as proficient in performance standards one, three, and four. Performance standard one is instructional leadership, standard three is family and community engagement, and standard four is professional culture and also to rate Dr. Provost as <coughs> exemplary in standard two, which is management and operations. Also, the evaluation team has concluded that Dr. Provost has met his professional practice and district improvement goals and has made significant progress in his student learning goal. Lastly, it's the recommendation of the superintendent evaluation committee to rate um, Dr. Provost with an overall summative performance rating as proficient. Thank you very much. Um, is there, are there any questions or comments uh, about the evaluation? And can you remind me, do we take a, I think we take a vote on this as a whole school committee, so we'll- We do. We yeah. do, so, um, so do you want to, just move that as so we get it out there on the, for discussion on the larger floor. Sure. So I would move to accept the superintendent summative evaluation as presented by myself. Okay. And the Second. And the, uh, uh, you're right. Evaluation. I'm sorry. The superintendent evaluation committee. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second? Second. So it's been seconded. <clears throat> so any questions? Do you have anything uh, to to say about it or? reflect on it I just want to thank the evaluation subcommittee for their work with me throughout the year it's a five-step process so two of the steps have to do with my own collection <coughs> and um, evaluation of where the district is and where my practice is as a leader and then we meet three times a year to agree on goals for the year to monitor progress along the way and the, to make the summative assessment it is probably um, at least a nine or ten hour investment of their time with me over the course of the year to make me a better superintendent. So I thank the subcommittee for that. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay. Um, hearing none, then I would ask for a vote of the school committee. All those in favor of, um, of accepting the summative evaluation of Dr. Provost, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that, uh, that is complete. Uh, next, we have a vote uh, for, on a new job description. This is for the Innovation Pathway Program Coordinator. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. 
this job description matches one of the positions that was placed into the grant that's been referred to several times throughout the year. This person is primarily responsible for making sure that students stay on the pathway and complete the pathway. Um, I would note anecdotally that one of the pieces of feedback we got from the state when we were making our application is that they thought we were setting our expectations a little bit low. Um, we thought if we could enroll just 12 freshmen, it would be a good start. Um, we have exceeded that in terms of freshmen. We also have 14 sophomores. Um, the 10th grade is the second entry point. After that, it gets too late. There are too many courses and students don't have a chance to make up. But the 14 sophomores who we weren't expecting have joined the program and are doing internships this summer. They um, have not only been happy to be coming to school and learning over the summer, but they've definitely increased the productivity of our IT department. Just as an example, um, last year inventorying the computers at the high school took four days. This year with um, one tech supervising 14 of our students, we were able to get it done in a day and a half. So this is a really good program, but it requires someone to keep them um, focused. And a, a big part of this will be um, assisting with transportation as students get into the college courses. Um, so that's why you see the, the pieces of this job description that involve having a license and being able to transport students. Okay. Yes, Ms. Um, because it's a grant, it's sort of, it's only a limited amount of time at mm -hmm. this point. Does that affect? Sustainability? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so how you pitch the job, I suppose. So one of the things that the Department of Ed has asked all of the districts who received the grant to do is fill out worksheets at, on, on an ongoing basis to capture the costs of programming because the goal here is to come up with a separate stream of funding in excess of Chapter 70 that will be able to fund the programs going forward. Um, was I wrong in thinking that at some point we had talked about them taking public transportation. You're um, not wrong. Okay, and so. And that might still be an option. Okay, but you want to have both options available. Yes. Is that what you're saying, okay. Response. Um, I just, I, I'm struck that uh, it seems very important for somebody to have a driver's license, I understand that, um, and lots of people would fit that and an associate's degree. But this other thing you commented on I think is super important, and that is the ability for this person, and it's bulleted here, to oversee each student's participation and completion and manage the student internships. And to me, that's a quite a bit higher level than some of those other functions. And I, I, I guess my question is, do you think we're gonna find somebody that's really capable? Um, it, it, the recommended minim, minimum qualifications <coughs> are two years of related experience. So that, I don't know if that's enough mm -hmm. for that important role and I, that's just my question. And I think I'll honestly say we won't know until we try it. Um, we think these are reasonable expectations. We think that we will get some people who um, who might be, I mean we're not thinking about any individual person, but we know people certainly in the IT field who've come through non-traditional pathways and have been successful. So we want to post it and see what happens. Okay. Other questions? So I would then entertain a motion to approve the job description. Motion to approve the job description innovation pathway program coordinator. Is there a second? Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, second job description. Uh, the next job description is professional learning community coordinator. Again, I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. And this position really is just a way of structuring additional hours for a teacher. Um, in the contract, we're able to provide teachers with additional work at $30 an hour. I think at some point in this contract, it might go up to $35 an hour. But we want to, um, when we do that, we want to be clear about what the expectations are. And this is a um, position, if you want to call it that, it's extra hours, really, um, to help us coordinate the work of the PLCs. Um, PLCs have been one of our most successful forms of professional development this year. They were one of my professional goals. Um, we ended up having many more PLCs than we thought we were going to have. And 
Um, as I'm going to be talking about later on tonight, we have a very massive audit that's coming to the district that's really going to um, crush central office's availability in time. Before we even knew about that, we had district improvement goals that in involved looking at standard-based grading and reforming our, um, reforming our code of conduct and um, finishing up the work on the curriculum, all of which are going to take significant amount of time from central office. And so this is one way of trying to increase our capacity by just splitting off the piece of work that says someone needs to be watching the PLCs, making sure they're all following some similar structures, and also documenting the learning so that when we have reviews and audits, we can say who was involved in, in PLCs and what they got out of the process. Any other questions about uh, that? This is Bernard. I just think this is also exciting because it gives opportunities for um, the community of educators to step forward, and it's always wonderful to see that. So then I motion to approve the job description for the professional learning community coordinator. Second. A motion made second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, next we have a vote to approve a MOA for the Unified Basketball Team Coaching Stipend. And I'll turn that one over to you, Dr. Provost. And this is a follow-up from the June school committee meeting at which we approved, or the school committee approved a reduced rate recommended by administration for students participating in Unified Basketball based on the, um, the fact that it's going to be a shortened season. Similarly, the administration recommended a reduced rate for the basketball coach because there'll be fewer games and fewer practices involved. <coughs> so this MOU has been reviewed by your attorney and has been reviewed by NACE. It's um, in line with our recommendations and been found acceptable to everybody. So I would ask for um, approval of this MOU. Make a motion to approve the MOA Unified Basketball Team Coaching Statement. Second. Second. Um, <laughs> is there any questions about this, including the difference between an MOU and an MOA? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Mr. I'm just curious. So, is the unified is golf, tennis, and cheerleading? Do, do they also have reduced schedules? And re, I mean, why does unified basketball kind of slot in so neatly there? Um, there is a same amount of time, more or less. There is a whole different um, structure for coaches. I think there are, I can't remember all the standards that went into setting the different tiers, but one factor was the number of games or practices. Another factor was the amount of risk involved in the sport. Um, I think another factor was whether you were supervising um, assistant coaches and so forth. So. Uh, I don't know offhand okay. what the what the rate is for golf or or cheerleading. I do know what the rationale for this was was they started with or Kara started with the basketball coach's salary and said, Well we need to build back from that. It's the same sport, but it's gonna be a different season. Thanks. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve the MOA. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Next, we have another MOA uh, seeking approval. This is with uh, NACE on the musical course to be held outside of school hours. This MOA is really sort of the culmination of one of my desperate discussions to try to keep musical um, going in the district. As I said, the, the real crux of the problem from my perspective was that in renegotiations, um, similar to coaches, a standard set of um, rubrics was applied to all of the different stipends for activities, and it resulted in the musical stipends being reduced, which meant that it really um, was no longer such an appealing position for staff. That had to do with the snafu with scheduling last year. Um, 
part of the reason why it was going to be in the fall, but then kind of died when it was in the spring as the idea was, well, maybe it's worth it if we only have to practice for a short period of time and get um, a production made. But if we have to be with the students all year, that you know certainly changes the value proposition. And so um, one of the questions I posed in the context of those discussions was, well, what if this wasn't a stipend? What if it just was a class? Um, and I, I think that at the time, Bo Flayhive really sort of was interested in it, but it was too far gone. We were, you know, at that point, pretty far into the spring, and it was too late to pull together a musical. Um, but that conversation continued. And so this is an MOA <coughs> that would allow an adjustment to the contract for her. So instead of teaching the same four periods that other teachers at the high school have, she would basically be on a split schedule and she would come in later and then her musical class would meet after the school day. Um, this would take the place of several of the stipends. There are a few stipends that would continue to um, exist in the contract for things that wouldn't be covered by Ms. Flayhive. For example, the um, costume coordinator, choreographer, we'd still need to bring in people for those positions and they'd still be stipend. But, but um, many of the stipends which were all combined in the position of the person who was more or less in charge of the musical piece of the musical um, would now be instead taken care of by making it a class for her. Make a motion to approve the MOA with names on the musical course to be held outside school hours. Second it. <laughs> <laughs> so the motion is made and seconded. Um, is there any other questions or discussions about this position? Gotcha. Oh, sorry. Yes, Ms. Foss. Question. Sure. Um, and I'm going to start by saying I think this is a great solution. I understand the problems with the musical, so my question is not aimed at being against this, I'm just trying to understand an effect I think this might have and make sure we think it through. Um, so uh, a teacher is going to teach one less um, credit-bearing class during the, during the day so that we can enable this wonderful mm -hmm. activity that goes on that so many people are benefiting from. What happens to that missing class? Um, are we going to have students not able to take um, whatever classes she teaches, are they other classes going to get bigger? Are we going to hire somebody to teach a one-off during the day? Is this an issue? We're not going to um, we're not going to hire anyone else to replace the class that would be reduced. You are right that it is essentially a loss of a course from her teaching load. Um, it neither the principal nor the teacher have seen it having an adverse effect on class sizes in the other classes. So. Um, the plan is not to replace that. I will, um, I will point out at the same time that we're losing this class, we are adding a class of instrumental music. Um, so that might, to a certain extent, help with the pressure. Um, but the plan at this point is not to add any more sections. Yes, follow up. I, I'm not that familiar with this part of the high school. What class are we losing? I actually don't know the answer okay. to that question. I can get back to you on that. Okay. Or general, does she teach? <coughs> So she teaches, um, she teaches the a cappella group, the Northamptons, that's a class. Okay. Chorus. She teaches a right, chorus. Chorus. larger chorus. Like chamber mm -hmm. choir. And chamber mm -hmm. choir, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and I think that this is just, so one, is it one semester she's, that's right. is this afternoon class and the second semester it goes back to the regular schedule? That's right. Mm -hmm. So. There is, I mean, to sort of follow up on your concern. Yeah. Mr. I, and I, I, if I understand how this works, I actually think another side effect of it is a pretty positive one in terms of opening up the way that the high school is scheduled. Um, that students will now be enrolling in a class that meets in the in a, in a time when we've never had classes meet before. And I think actually that's really positive. And you know. You, I can sort of, in ter positive in terms of being able to adjust to students' lives and in terms of adjusting to, you know, in other words, instead of doing an arbitrary model where we pick some times during the day when we have classes and you got to come there and you got to stay until the end and, and you know, sort of the, the true factory model of having a class that's based on an appropriate time, which, you know, using it 
make sense to do it after schools because that way you can have all these a really large number of kids available to do it for an extended period of time. And um, you know, I can picture there might be other opportunities like that, you know, either because you have teachers or because you have subject matter where it makes sense to be scheduled somewhat differently. And just to start to sort of edge into this idea of having a of a high school schedule that's well not like what you have at college. <laughs> But, but that you know, maybe takes advantage of some of those opportunities that a more open schedule has. Dr. Provost. If I can just follow up on that comment with something that I don't think made it into the minutes from the uh, superintendent's evaluation meeting. <coughs> that was part of the discussion around this. Um, my comment was something to the effect of, I don't really understand why we do all the things we do in schools. And you know, anytime I see an opportunity to try something different, I want to try it just to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like I said, and this, it's edging into it. It's not like we've mm -hmm. decided we're just going to open the book and let right. teachers schedule whenever they want to schedule. But, <laughs> but it, you know, it might see how it works and see if it you know, works. Before I go to you, did you, did you, would you uh, was your questions answered? I have a different question to okay. go to. So after Ms. Buse's answer. Uh, well, I'm very happy to hear that the, or see that the musical is coming back. I think it really was missing. So thank you for working so hard on that. But. Um, and maybe I read this too quickly, but um, do would students get cr a credit, a class credit, a course credit for doing the musical after school? Is that 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 has not been part of the MOU because this just okay, affects the contract. It really hasn't been a um, a decision that we've made yet. Um, it ha I don't believe it's in the course of studies at this point, so it would have to be amended if it was going to be a credit bearing course. Um, I just think there are a lot of things that. You know, we're trying this for the first time, and we haven't really decided. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even sure, not being a musical person myself, if all of the students would go there every day, which you mm -hmm. typically have in you know most classes. So I don't know the answer to that. So it still sort of sits as an after school. Right. The main thing that we wanted to accomplish with after school was making sure that it didn't compete with one of the other courses in the schedule, mm -hmm. because we thought that would sort of limit the interest in it. Mm -hmm. Of course. It creates the problem of that now it's competing with sports, but you know, it's but it's always yeah. right. So that's but it kind of fits in. Right. It still it still fits into that winter sport time frame, that's that right. winter mm -hmm. activity time frame. Okay, thank you. That was exactly my question. My understanding was this was not for credit, and we were just the memo of understanding was to try this <coughs> very much one year experience and see what happens, but mm -hmm. not for credit. Well, we wouldn't address that in the MOU anyways because this just reflects <coughs> the contract, the employment agreement. Okay. So, um, there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this MOA. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that MOA is approved. Um, next, we move on to a fourth reading on the uh, request to name the basketball court at Ryan Road Elementary School Legends Court. So we're in fourth reading. Um, um, I did have a conversation with um, Mr. Kaufman, uh, and, um, and had he been here this evening, he had intended uh, to make um, a motion to request that we waive the fifth and sixth readings and, and move forward to a vote on the name. Um, they're apparently um, going to be having a tournament um, that's going to be before we get through with the fifth and sixth uh, readings of this. Um, and so, um, and you know, frankly, when the when the surplusing and the, all the other approvals went forward uh, to allow this to be built, you know, or the approval to allow it to be built by this outside organization to accept the gift, and not only by the school committee but also by the um, city council, um, it was the gift was to accept a court named Legends Court. So I'm not actually sure we have much. You know, I, mean, I think we've actually done a lot of belt and suspenders to approve this uh, to approve this name change. So anyway, I throw it out there, uh, asking for a motion to approve this waiver of the fifth and sixth readings um, uh, to go ahead and make the naming official. If someone was willing to make that motion, mm -hmm. 
I'm happy to make that motion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I will move that we waive the fifth and sixth readings for all the reasons the mayor just stated. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing convinced from my rules and policy chair, but maybe somebody else will make a second on that. Second. Second. <laughs> uh, okay. So any d questions or discussion on this? And again, we you know we just uh, we did waive final readings to name. Um, the greenhouse at Jackson Street School recently um, to coincide, and so um, yes. I mean, I just want to say that I think in that case they did come right away and say that this person was retiring and mm -hmm. this was a big concern. Yeah. So I do sort of kind of formally want to say that it is our rules and policy, and perhaps Legends came to the City Council and said that they had a tournament coming up, but I don't, I don't feel that that message came to us. Yeah, um, no, I, they didn't come to the city council. I, I meant that the original order I, was to create a court I, called Legends Court. Right, but so, the, the push yeah. to waive the fifth and sixth reading is because they have a tournament That's correct. coming up. And I think the difference is that um, the retirement of Mrs. Bates was very clearly laid out and explained, mm -hmm. and this, you know, this tournament must have been planned for a while, and I wish that that had been expressed yeah. as well. So and again, I, I don't think it's a killing matter if, if we approve this or not, because there's already a sign that says Legends Court, and <laughs> there's already, you know, it's like there's already bricks <laughs> engraved up there. Um, I also feel that it's not, I mean, the other way that I feel this deviates from our policy is that we're not naming it after an individual. We're not, I mean, so that's just another, we're not naming it the, you know, whoever fill in the blank name of someone is being called Legends Court, um, which is sort of a little bit more general. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, so again, I intend to vote in favor, and if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass, and the tournament will go forward. So any other questions or comment? Is the current motion simply to uh, waive the readings and then hold a vote, or is the current vote on the name? Um, I think it would be to, because uh, basically we don't take a vote on fifth reading, we don't take a vote on sixth reading. Um, we do take a vote on sixth reading, I suppose. So um, I guess it would be to waive, I think the motion was to waive fifth and sixth readings and vote to approve it. Yes, Ms. Busanski. Um I am two also going to vote for it. I, I agree with you, but two I two think different. just reflecting on what Ms. Burnham said, we did have a conversation a couple of school committees ago where we about the importance of the six readings, which I think to me personally does feel excessive, and I wonder if it's worth, we're now having sort of two examples where we all feel pretty comfortable by the fourth reading. I think Mary Bates' is, was also a fourth reading, right? But. Um, Anyway, it's sort of interesting to note that maybe six readings is a little excessive. It's worse than you think, and now I'm going to turn it into <laughs> <laughs> No, all I want to say is we really have been working hard on this policy. No, I know you have. <laughs> We've worked on this policy for at least four subcommittee meetings, yep. and, and Ms. Hennessy is responsible for bringing us the what we hope is going to be the gold medal winning version of <clears throat> Um, of this new policy that will address the six reading issues um, for our next subcommittee meeting. So we're really optimistic that we'll get something to you that's different than six readings for the next. What I meant by worse meeting. was that I think that the I think the current rule actually reads six months, not six. Yeah, years. it does. It does. So, I wasn't going to bring oh, that up. That's a good so point. It actually, reads six months. Yeah, yeah. six that's readings. Good. So. Um, and we sometimes have more than one meeting in a month, but we've just always, past practice has been six readings. Yeah, I think, I think moving forward, I'd like to see us have rules that we follow, but um, I think that <laughs> practice has been that we are willing to make exceptions. <laughs> yes. Can I just ask a question? Are those two different things? Wouldn't it be that we're wait, we make a motion to waive the, five, the fifth and sixth reading, and then we make the motion about the Legends Court name? You know, it, it, or does it make no difference? I mean, the reading is the re I mean, a reading happens. If you'd like to divide the motions, we can. Um, really, the fifth reading being waived automatically takes you to the vote okay. on sixth, on the theoretically on the sixth the reading. Separate thing. We could do a roll call vote if we really want to draw it all out. No, no, it's totally fine with me. It's fine, um, it's fine. I was just curious. It seems like we could shoot the free throws. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, so that's I think well, I think that was okay. the intent of just waiving the the final readings and moving straight to the vote to approve. 
I think that was the intent of your motion. That was my intent. And if you'd like me to modify it, I'd be happy. So it's obviously if you if you want to amend no, the motion, you can. I was just okay. asking. Okay. <laughs> um, anyone else? Okay. Oh yes. I'll add a comment to it while we're on it. I. I, I can see in cases where maybe six readings you'd feel you wanted to hear them, but in this particular case, I'm very comfortable with this, partly because we've heard a lot of positive feedback from people coming in and talking about this, and we have not heard anything negative about it, and nobody is here tonight to talk about it. So I, I guess I feel really comfortable for those reasons as well, breaking our rules in this case, and <laughs> or amending our we're rules. Not breaking our we're rules. We're not breaking them. We're really amending them in a yeah. thoughtful way, and yeah. we're talking about whether or not it makes sense. and. <laughs> To some of us, it might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, any abstentions? Okay. So, um, so thank you for that, and thank you again. Obviously, thank you to the um, to the young men and women who raised all that money and uh, lined up all the contractors <coughs> and and built the amazing courts haven't seen them yet they're uh, they're incredible and they're being used um, a lot and so uh, so this is a great resource for the not only for the district but for the community so next we have a vote uh, to accept a gift from live pleasant limited partnership fifteen hundred dollars to the NHS art department for dumpster enclosure art Ms. Walczak Pretty much what it says. Um, this is a new <laughs> development over on Pleasant Street, the Live 155 building that's gone up. So they've generously offered a donation to help the art department do something a little more creative around the dumpsters. Hmm. So, I move to accept a gift from uh, uh, Live Pleasant Street of was it fifteen hundred dollars? Is there a second? Second. So there's been a motion made and seconded to accept the gift. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you to Live Pleasant for that gift. Um, and next we have a vote to accept uh, a gift of $5,060.89 from the Stop and Shop Rewards Program uh, to NHS, presumably the PTO or, or just the NHS director. It uh, goes into NHS. In the past, it's been divided between activities like the athletic department, um, senior class for some of their senior activities, so the principal works on how it gets allocated within the building. This is an annual gift we've been getting for years. It's basically um, from all of our shoppers that have identified Northampton High School as the recipient of the reward points. I would entertain a motion. Ms. Busansky. Would you make the motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to accept the gift from Stop and Shop Rewards Program in the amount of $5,060.89 to NHS. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any exemptions? Abstentions, sorry. <laughs> or exceptions. <laughs> Okay, um, next we have a vote to, uh, this is actually coming back to us because we voted to continue it to this meeting. Uh, this is on the approval of the curriculum subcommittee meeting minutes of May 10th, 2018 and May 31st, 2018. And I believe uh, Ms. Voss, uh, as chair, is going to make a motion on that. I'm not quite sure what my motion is. I think you were going to vote to refer them back I, to your okay, committee. You. So I'm going to um, make a motion to refer this back to our committee. Um, we haven't had a chance to, um, we need a chance to, f to figure out a couple things that were said. And I think this relates to the next thing on the agenda as well. But I'll leave that motion okay. to refer them back to the subcommittee. Okay. So the motion is then made to refer them back to the subcommittee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Yeah, I guess um, I didn't know. I thought that we were going to discuss it. And I guess I feel like I would just like to have a discussion of the minutes and to know what is wrong and make changes. Well. Um, so I think I'd like to move that we, I mean, can I make a motion that we? Well, we have a motion right now to refer right. them. So if that fails, then, okay. then, then it's this is, I'm just, so, but this is my discussion. Yeah. My discussion is yeah. I would really like to just talk about this 
um, yeah my um, the reason why I, the recommendation was to um, refer it to committee um, back to committee um, is that in looking at the process that we had proposed um, well first of all the practice of the school committee and it's sort of in the rules is that the minutes come to the full school committee to be accepted um, this has always been a little odd to me because the school committee all the committees create their minutes and then they approve their own minutes and then they get sent to the full city council who then accepts them as part of sort of the overall record obviously the you know seven of us can't really approve the minutes because we weren't there to really know what went on so it's sort of a, it's always been an odd contract it's never been an issue until recently when then there was question about the accuracy of the minutes or such as some questions about them um, so what we originally proposed was that okay we'll have the committee work with the clerk send the clerk um, their corrections or revisions and then the clerk would try to synthesize it all and bring it back to us the problem is is that when you look at the open meeting law um, the open meeting law makes it clear that public bodies and they define public bodies as you know committees subcommittees you know um, ad hoc committees any committees are required to keep minutes of their meeting and then approve <coughs> minutes of their meeting um, and that to approve the minutes um, because it's not exempt uh, from open meeting law involves deliberation by that body so the idea that you could have you can't really have a committee work it out amongst themselves outside of a public meeting they actually have to get together and discuss it they can certainly send stuff to the clerk who can try to compile it but the committee then needs to think needs to work it all out in a in a in a public meeting and then vote on it um, so what i was proposing to do in the next round of motions was to send a couple of our policies to the rules and policy committee because it's sort of silent on the issue of you know subcommittees and what they're supposed to do with their minutes um, our our uh, our actual uh, you know um, rules of order talk only about the full committee's minutes it talks nothing about the subcommittee um, and even the policy on minutes itself is silent about how subcommittees are supposed to do that so um, so uh, the question was we could try as a whole committee it just didn't it just didn't seem to fit with how this should be done to have the entire committee discussing whether uh, questions about the minutes of a subcommittee that only three of us were at so that was why the recommendation was either to continue it again um, because because it also puts um, the clerk in the position of she got well she got one response she got two different responses she didn't get a third response um, and how would she be able to then try to synthesize that um, so I think that was the idea was to have the committee um, try to figure out the synthesis of that so that's the that's the background on it um, in trying to sort through and again this has not been an issue that's come up before because I think we've just definitely the minutes have come forward they've been accepted by the full school committee and that's how it's worked but it did kind of expose sort of an oddity in the way in our in our practice um, so that's the background on why I was going to recommend we put the but we still have a motion on the table to refer to the subcommittee and I, and to refer the to refer those, to those, those those two sets of minutes yeah. back to the subcommittee to I don't know what um, to, to rewrite them no to meet and to to meet and to have the different versions or the different questions that were presented individually to the clerk um, you know to to then try to sort that out and vote and approve what they all agree on are are the minutes for the meeting because you can't you know for example um, yeah. Ms. Burnham and Ms. Voss can't have a discussion about what they think the proper because right. that would be a deliberation by a quorum right, right. Um, outside of a meeting so and then my goal would be going forward we just establish it as practice that meetings happen minutes are taken then at the next committee meeting those minutes are approved by the subcommittee and then they go to the full committee to be accepted 
So that's sort of what I think should happen. Um, so again, oddly enough, the open meeting law is silent on how you approve minutes. So I mean, you couldn't come up with a different way of approval of minutes if you wanted to. Um, I've read more about this in the last week or so than I ever wanted to imagine yeah. reading the Attorney General and all the other stuff, the guidance on it. So that's, so that's sort of the backstory on this. Yes, Ms. Fallon. I do have to say I find it frustrating again that now you're saying, you know, well, our past practice was this and this is what our policy says, but I'm recommending this. I, I understand that you want to refer those policies for the subcommittee to address, but it is frustrating, I think, for the Rules and Policy Subcommittee to work really hard on policies sometimes and then feel that occasionally they're they're just not disregarded, but you know that we make exceptions frequently. That's all. I, I feel like you just argued that this but has I'm been a, for past practice, and I'm saying this has always been our practice. But I'm saying there's actually nothing in our policies that that even supports the current practice, much less what I've Right, but then, so then you would look at past practice, and you're saying past practice has always been to approve them in a full committee meeting. And you're saying past practice was that we approved other namings on the fourth reading. I was just saying past practice was that we just approved minutes at this meeting, and until we changed the policy, it seems like that's what we do, either wait to refer it back until the policy's changed or wait until to address this. And, and that's the pleasure of the full committee. There's a motion made to refer the two sets of minutes back to the committee, but certainly the committee could say, well, that's not our practice and we can, we'll, 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 we want to maintain the current practice until the practice has been changed. That's certainly within the purview of the committee. But certainly referring something to a committee is not a violation of any rules or, what I'm, what I'm saying is that if there's a there's a clear disagreement among the three members of the committee about what the minutes should be, and there's no way for them to communicate about that except in a public in, in a open meeting. Um, so it either has to be at the subcommittee level or it has to be at the full committee level. And so I just um, well it was it was ref it was continued to tonight. And so that certainly could be the, that certainly is the case. Yeah. So there's a, but there is a motion, motion. Yep. to refer, yep. and so we should vote on the motion and then we can figure out what we want to do. Yes, Ms. Voss. Thanks. So, so as the mayor said, we have a motion and I'll just say I could imagine another motion if people aren't happy with this one. And thank you for that description because that, in some ways, if these two items had been reversed on the agenda, it might have made more sense. So what was just described is essentially the next motion and that's the background story for it. And if, and, and I, I agree with what was just said and think that we need to look forward to how we do this, but if people are uncomfortable changing it at this point for this particular set of, of notes, part of the problem is we have three committee members and as you said, we can't talk amongst ourselves. And um, the third one isn't here. So for us to hash this out and have two people, but the third person who um, is part of things that that person said are a big part of what the disagreement is, is very hard to have that conversation when we knew he was out of the country tonight. So my other motion I could, we could, I could hear back from you and I could take that one off the table and put a different motion forward would be to delay this. If you want to talk about it on the full committee, we could do that in August, assuming all three members of the subcommittee are present. If you want to talk about the meeting notes the way we, you all have done it before with all of us here, I personally think that's a waste of seven people's times because they weren't at the meeting and I'd rather take care of it amongst the people that were just at the meeting. But I'm open to that approach too. I think those are really the two options we have. Serve the two. Ms. Pusansky. I mean, I do think having recently, we recently had a conversation about making our, meet, our meetings more efficient, that it would be more efficient for us to refer this back to the subcommittee and let them hash it out. And maybe the policy, since there is no policy, it's not that we're making an exception to a policy, there's no writing on it, according to the mayor. I can't find it. We can find that um, that in since the majority of cases we do seem to all agree on meeting mi subcommittee minutes. It, this hasn't really been an issue that it only gets referred back when there's a disagreement that it goes to the committee. And if there's disagreement on the minutes, then they have to refer it back. But I guess that's, that's a good idea. That's for the 
pol rules and policy to decide. But to me, it feels like, I, well, I agree with Dr. Voss, which he said about the third members not here, and also just for the sake of efficiency of our meeting, it feels like it just would be more efficient for the subcommittee to, you know, figure it out and finalize the meetings themselves before it comes to us. Okay, so before we get too far ahead, um, there's been a motion made to refer these two minutes to this curriculum subcommittee. It's been seconded. And I'll ask all those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. All those who are abstaining, okay. So that motion carries. Actually, I'm gonna abstain. Okay. I feel kind of conflicted since I'm a part of it. <laughs> okay. Sorry, All right. I'm abstaining. Okay, so one, so one abstention and the motion carries. Um, so then the next item on the agenda is um, my request that we refer um, policy BDE, which is on subcommittees, and policy uh, BEDG, uh, which is on minutes, to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee for review of the subcommittee minutes approval process or lack thereof, I put in there, because the, it's, the, there isn't really a clear process delineated in the rules. So this is just a vote to refer those to, uh, to <coughs> the Rules and Policy Committee to have them looked at. And, uh, motion? Yes, please. I'll second it. I'll, I'll, you'll make the motion. I'll, I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. <coughs> Is there any discussion? I, I would just say in regards to uh, this, I'm looking forward to finding a solution for sure. Um, as I look at the dates, I mean, one of the dates is uh, May 10th, so I'm not sure when the subcommittee will actually meet to kind of go through this. Um, I'm 47 and my memory is okay, but as I get older and time goes by, I realize that it's harder and harder to really recount the facts that occurred on those dates and so my concern is that if this is going to be part of our policy and we're going to look back that um, there are some of these subcommittees that don't meet all that often so if we have a discrepancy on uh, the meeting minutes and then we don't meet for another three or four months and then as we go to go over them trying to recall the events and do a really good job of making sure that it's captured what happened um, we have a very able clerk that sits there and does a very good job, in my opinion, of capturing exactly what's happening on that day. And we don't have to think about it. We just need to have our conversations and do the work that's on our agendas for those days. And, um, you know, my experience has been that, um, and, and, I, and I trust the work of the clerk to do a very good job in capturing that, knowing that in all humanness from time to time something may be misrepresented. So my concern would be just moving forward that if we're going to look into this and we're going to have the, um, the policy of approving minutes before they come to the full board, that we're not meeting several months later to approve minutes and then try to amend them when we can't remember what day it was on, <laughs> never mind what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, one of the recommendations, and I'm, I've told the chair already that I'll, I'm going to make some recommendations to the committee about what I think about this, <coughs> is that, um, again, I'm turning to my experience on the city council, um, I think we should record the subcommittee meetings um, somehow, that we should either do an NCTV recording, which all the subcommittees of the city council are recorded, or even just a, a voice recording, that way that there's a record in case there is. And that helps the clerk too, because then that'll provide, you know, some something for her, a safety net for her, um, if there's any question about the accuracy of them. It also makes it easier for her to maybe to compose the minutes if there's something she's unsure of. She can go back and listen to it. Um, the only thing you just have to do is announce that the meeting's being recorded. So yes. How does that work? Do you guys maintain the recordings until the minutes are approved and then record over it? Or are you then responsible? They're actually for actually on storage? CCTV. No, if you were to audio record it. Um, is it like a the a, only thing um, that's required would be keeping a, keeping the paper minutes um, what we do with NCTV can I see Chen yeah. yeah we have a little camera and they upload it there is a camera in this uh, room right here you'd have to ask a custodian for it but it's for you guys if you want to use it so they actually have a camera for us mm -hmm. just like they, they have a roll out and use in this room or a different room in the school it just needs to go back and 
and then you it just gets turned on, turned off at the end. Yeah, and you just let us know, and we'll come and pick it up and upload it. And then you guys retrieve it, upload it, and it goes on to YouTube and the NCTV yeah. site, and then it's there. Um, and all the city council subcommittees just turn on their camera. Um, and actually, most of our other boards and committees do the same thing, just manually, like the zoning board, or the planning board, or the tree committee. They just, yeah. yeah, they just all turn on the camera as part of the deal. So, um, it would also allow the, maybe the public greater access to some of our meetings as well. So, anyway, that's just a thought. Yes. Just building on comments that were just made, um, I completely agree. When many many weeks go by, it can be hard to remember what was done at meetings and I'm wondering if your review of the meeting process the minutes is there a time frame when the meeting notes should be out so for example I feel like we're inconsistent in terms of getting notes from these meetings and they are recorded so it's probably feels a little less urgent um, clearly the notes are super important because you want a record of what actually happened at the meeting right and I don't know what our what our practice is in terms of how quickly these get turned around in general but I think I've my short time here, I've seen very different lengths of time printed on different meeting notes. Yeah, the um, and, and, interestingly, and the open meeting law actually says um, it's ridiculous. I think, but I think it says like th thirty days or three meetings, whichever is longer, is what the open meeting law says. Um, so the open meeting law sets a limit on them. Uh, and obviously the draft minutes are always required to be released like uh, upon request so if you don't if you haven't approved your minutes you're always required to produce the draft even if it's just on legal paper mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know what our rules are about that um, so but I mean again three meetings again you, you may only meet once every couple of months so it's probably you know I'm just saying a subcommittee may meet so I think we're not violating that but we may want to set up rules around that too I don't know well and and I bring it up because when if it's going to go to a subcommittee maybe we want to add to the um, desire to have something there where under normal conditions the committee would review the meeting notes within so many days or months or whatever you think is reasonable Okay. so that's and again maybe that's something we can if you want to communicate that to the committee as a suggestion that would be great um, Okay, so again, the, the motion is just to refer these policies to be looked at, um, uh, and uh, any, any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the next item on the agenda is the business administrator's report. Yes, there's no financial report this month. We are in the process of closing out the books, so I should have a final report for you at the August school committee meeting. Um, to mention, as you're aware, we took in students this year that were displaced by Hurricane Maria. The state had a couple of rounds of state aid, state reimbursement for us that came through. The total amount that we ended up receiving as of last week is $21,219. They allow us to use that this year or next year. And since we had already allocated and transferred money to cover the expenses this year, um, and right now we do not need it to close the books out this year, we're recommending that money be left and be available to help the budget next year for any additional tutoring cost or any other expenses that come up. It doesn't have to be designated to a specific need. Um, school lunch debt. Um, I don't have this year's debt for you yet. We are still collecting and we will be making the payment from your budget to the food service budget next week based on what payments have not been made by parents for this school year. We're still collecting money in. We actually, with the help of an administrative assistant at the middle school today, received a check for $700 from one family to bring the debt down there. So um, I will let you know in August what the total amount we were required to pay this year ends up being. And I'll give you the history on the last couple of years. Um, and then we've talked in the past, we had referred seven families that owed us in excess of $500. It was actually the highest one was close to $1,500. We had our lawyer send out letters to those seven families. Um, three we are still trying to reach. The letters came back as undeliverable. We're still working with the attorney on that. Um, out of the four that received the letters, three have now agreed to payment plans, and the fourth one is in discussion and just hasn't wrapped up a payment plan yet. And we've received at least one payment from those three families that have made an agreement to a payment plan, one of those payment plans being the family that owed the most money. 
So we've made a little bit of progress there, and um, hopefully we'll get people more on track with this. Uh, gifts. <clears throat> we've had a couple of gifts during the month of Ju June to early July. Um, there was one gift from a PTO accepted at Bridge Street School. It was $900 to donate to the library from a fundraiser that they held at Broadside Books to purchase books for the library. And there were three gifts accepted by the superintendent. One from Kareen Wiener, which was a, a Mac computer that's going to be used in our um, IT program. It wasn't a, one that was current enough that we can use it. UMass donated a gift certificate to Broadside Books in the amount of $1,000 to Jackson. This was because of Jackson School's involvement in a uh, survey project with UMass. So as a thank you, they made a $1,000 donation that will allow them to buy some books for their library renovation project. And then we had a donation from Tish Sirani and Vanessa Van Steele of $630 basically to cover student debt at Ryan Street School. They had contacted the principal and asked what the debt was at a certain point in June and actually wrote us a check to cover all the debt on the books at Ryan Street School at that time. Um, and to remind you, this is actually the second time that parents at Ryan's, uh, Ryan, Road. Ryan Road School, something wasn't sounding right. Three times. <laughs> it's the second time this year that parents at Ryan Road School have made donations to underwrite the debt of other students. So to this family and to the family in the past, thank you very much for those donations. And then lastly, you have copies of the two warrants that have been signed since your last school committee meeting by your designate. Okay. Um, and personnel report. Yep. Uh, June was mostly separations. We saw 19 employees leaving the district, as well as non-retirements, um, which were people that were honored at our last school committee meeting with the retirement reception. And then we had one new hiring of a secretary. Next, we move to the superintendent's report. Let me start by also adding one more separation that I haven't had an um, opportunity to communicate with the school committee. It happened um, quite quickly when I was out of state. Caitlin Champagne from the middle school has left for a position <coughs> in Westfield. That position is posted. We have not found replacement for her at this time. Um, but that'll be another change to our administrative leadership team as we look into the next year. So, um, last Friday I was informed that Northampton had been, quote, selected for an on-site district accountability review under provisions of Chapter 15, sec Section 55A by the Office of District Reviews and Monitoring. It's not a sentence that anyone looks forward to, um, not because it indicates that anything is um, amiss, but because it is, um, I think, of sort of the mother of all educational audits that the department does. Um, this actually came out of a time when there was some concern that the PQA audit, which Dr. Plummer discussed at the beginning of the meeting, was not thorough enough. And so there was another sort of investigatory branch under the Department of Education that came up with this other audit. Um, I were, in terms of hours, that it, it takes to prepare and, and um, actually participate in this audit. I can tell you that it was the majority of the work that I did as my practicum for the superintendency. And you need to do 300 hours for that. Um, so this is, this is huge. Um, so I've been looking back at where Northampton has come since the time of its last district review, which is in 2012. In 2012, all six schools were below the 50th percentile for their grade spans in mathematics on MCAS, and four of the six were below the 50th percentile for the grade spans in English language arts. In math, three of the schools were performing below the 20th percentile, and one was in the bottom 10% of schools. As of 2017, all but one school was performing above the 50th percentile in English language arts, and in mathematics, the high school had improved performance above the 50th percentile. None of the schools remained in the bottom 10% for math, and only one school was below the 20th percentile in math. Throughout the whole period, Northampton's science performance exceeded statewide averages. For our largest subgroup, white students, 
The period from 2012 to 2017 was a time of steady improvement. As our students kept pace with the statewide averages for their subgroup in English language arts and closed performance gaps in mathematics, improvement was particularly noted at the high school for the subgroup, where 94% of white students scored proficient or advanced on math in 2017, as opposed to the statewide average of 86% for white students. The story was much the same for the special education subgroup. Again, the greatest performance gains were at the high school in the area of mathematics, where 50% of students with disabilities scored proficient or advanced in the 10th grade math assessment, as compared to 41% of students with disabilities statewide. Because three through eight, MCAS changed to the next generation during that 2012 to 2017 period. And because the ELL subgroup is too small to provide a reportable cohort at individual grade levels in 2012, when the ELL subgroup was much smaller than it is now, the only direct comparisons we have are on math, I'm sorry, are on science, because science combines fifth, eighth, and 10th grade, um, three grades where science is assessed. In 2012, there was not a single ELL in the district that was proficient or advanced on any science test. Last year, 5% of our ELLs were proficient as compared to 7% statewide. We don't have any advanced yet statewide. There's only 1% of ELLs who are advanced in science. But certainly, great progress from the days when all of our ELAs, ELLs rather were automatically um, and needs improvement, warning, or failing. In 2012, the district was cited for underperformance of the Hispanic or Latino subgroup, a group that then was 14.5% of the district population and which now has grown to 16% of our population. Unlike the district as a whole or the subgroups described above, our Hispanic or Latino students have not seen performance improvements. And as the achievement gaps of all the other subgroups and as students as a whole has increased, the achievement gap between our Hispanic or Latino subgroup and the rest of the students in the district has actually gotten worse since it was in 2012. In 2012, we were cited for having insufficient curriculum leadership. Now we have a director of curriculum and assessment, a team of te curriculum teacher leaders, the 2012 review found that the district did not have an updated documented curriculum guide to inform instruction in core content areas. Now we have a mostly complete district curriculum that is accessible to all teachers via Atlas Rubicon and is organized around a common set of transfer goals and the understanding by design framework. In 2012, the district, the review team concluded the district does not yet have a balanced and comprehensive assessment, sys uh, assessment system from kindergarten through grade 12. Now we have an RTI system based on universal screening, on-demand assessments which are embedded within our documented curriculum, and we have an extensive list of district determined measures. In 2012, the district was cited for having limited technology capacity. Now we have wall-to-wall -wall Wi-Fi, a growing fleet of devices, a strong team of technology integrators led by a digital literacy and computer science coordinator, and even an IT innovation pathway. We also have a data dashboard which gives teachers simplified process for accessing their students' relevant information. In 2012, the reviewers found that the district-wide uh, district supervision model does not exist. Now all licensed staff, including the superintendent, are evaluated using the Massachusetts model system. Professional development was also cited as a deficiency in 2012, in part because district PD expenditures failed to reach statewide averages on a per pupil basis, partly because teachers did not have enough time for professional development, and partly because the PD committee was not active or connected to the central office administration. District PD expenditures are still low uh, as compared to similar districts and to the state, but we now have job embedded PD through our two academic coaches and our four technology integrators. We also have an active PD committee that the curriculum director sits on. And so I think we've made substantial progress in this area. I hope the reviewers will agree 
Um, we still do have the problem with money, but I think we have a much more robust system of professional development than we had in 2012. In 2012, it was recommended that the district increase supports for students of color and low-income students to encourage more of them to participate in honor and AP courses. This is an area where we have yet to make progress. Um, fifth, this is something that I asked our high school administrators to look into as part of the new accountability system that's going to replace the accountability system we had under the old MCAS. And so I can tell you that 54% of last year's 11th and 12th graders were enrolled in advanced STEM classes, but only 23% of students of color and 19% of students with disabilities were in advanced STEM classes. Looking back to AP courses in 2016, 86% of the students taking AP were white only 5% were Hispanic or Latino, and just 3% were students with disabilities. So I think that finding continues to exist and is something that we um, have yet to make progress on. Finally, the district was criticized for producing inadequate budget documentation and for directing too much funding to special education, thereby draining resources from general education programs. As you know, the entire budget process has been revised and in my view greatly improved. And I'll just point this out as one point of comparison with respect to special ed. The FY19 budget includes less for out of district tuition than the FY2012 budget had when that, when that finding was um, made. Um, it was 8% in 2012, it's 7% in 2019, and that means something when 1% of your budget is almost $400,000. So the deficiencies, uh, of the deficiencies noted in 2012, I believe that we've corrected about half and substantially improved a little less than half. I don't believe we've done what's necessary to allow our his Hispanic or Latino students achieve at levels that can be reasonably expected. And I don't believe that we've broken down barriers preventing students of color, students with disabilities, and economically disadvantaged students from accessing the highest level courses at our high school. I hope the reviewers will mainly agree with this assessment and our progress towards correcting our past deficiencies. And I hope the process doesn't reveal too many new weaknesses that were not present in 2012. Most of all, I hope they can help us focus our energy on fixing what I see as the two remaining problems from 2012, improving outcomes for our Hispanic and Latino students, and ensuring that our highest level classes reflect the diversity that we value in our district. So I'll tell you that based on my past experience, preparing for this audit is an eight month campaign. On top of the other initiatives that we've already included in the district improvement and plan, and our anticipated beginning of contract negotiations. I think the district central office team is likely going to be pushed beyond capacity. Um, so I just want to put that out there. I want to apologize to everyone if I seem less available or less present during the next eight months. There will not be 100 visits to schools in the upcoming year. Um, we're really going to have our hands full with with this process. So I just want to be proactive in asking you and asking the parents, asking our faculty and staff to understand if we have to put things on hold or if it takes us a little bit longer to get back to you while we are involved in this district review. That's my report. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, there is uh, no business on this evening's agenda, no new business on New business on this evening's agenda. Uh, future business and meeting dates, we have a budget and property subcommittee meeting on July 26th at 1 p.m. in the superintendent's office. The rules and policy subcommittee on August 2nd in the superintendent's office, that's at 9.30 a.m. And then the school committee meeting next is August 9th, 2018 at 7.15 p.m. here in the JFK community room. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.